So good morning. It's Sunday morning at the Stony Point Center, and uh, I'm Mark Johnson, the executive director of the Center and Library for the Study of the Bible and Social Justice, and I'm with Tom Boomershine of the Network of Biblical Storytellers and of GoTell.org. This is the final of five sessions that we've recorded over the last two days. This on biblical performance criticism, a new paradigm for biblical interpretation, uh, grounded here in the resurrection story. But the other story of these five segments is that Tom's book, The Messiah of Peace, is about to be published by Ruth and Stock. And this has really been an unpacking of uh, the intention and the content of that book as well. So we already know we're looking forward to building some additional learnings and teachings and trainings around uh, the use of uh, storytelling as a strategy for social justice, which is the head, uh, the title of our theme here these two days, telling the stories of Jesus as a strategy for social justice and peacemaking in the global community. So welcome, Tom. We're going to give the others just a minute to get here from our uh, circle and another building, but we're uh, getting close to start. Anything you want to say in reflection before we start here? Yeah, there is. I was just thinking of that <clears throat> Mark and I were just talking about uh, the way in which his energy of uh, hopefulness has generated uh, these uh, streaming uh, events and that I was initially even though I've studied media all my life and been an advocate, my instinctive response has been skepticism. I didn't think anybody would get on this and hear this at all. And I'm also aware that that's been, that was my initial you know, gut reaction to thinking about the possibility that storytelling would be a source of empowerment. And I initially thought, well, that's trivial. What difference would it make? But the more I've studied this through the history of the subsequent periods since this story of the resurrection and the story of Mark is told, I've become aware, and the more I do it, the more I am aware of it, that we instinctively underestimate the power of storytelling for social transformation. And these stories of the Gospels uniquely are sources of primary empowerment of people in relation to peacemaking. And so the whole business of performance criticism is bringing scholarly resources for the empowerment of people to tell these stories of peace. Uh, and uh, so even as I am inherently skeptical, I'm also even more hopeful and so the extension of this uh, event that we've had uh, in this way is just another sign of hope for me. So we, as we were bringing this on stream this morning, we were looking and two dozen people have looked at our introduction with uh, Norman Gottwald on uh, Friday afternoon. And then a number of people have been then going on to uh, the individual session. So yeah, go tell, go tell people to come look. That's come right. see. <laughs> and so we'll, uh, Conclude now over the next hour or so here. Welcome.
Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just waiting for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the the purpose of this session is to uh, outline uh, a new paradigm for the study of the Bible and for its interpretation that is foundational for, first of all, the recovery, the rediscovery of the stories of the Bible as stories to be told to audiences. And then the purpose of this seminar has been the empowerment of people as storytellers and as persons who can enable and empower other storytellers. That's what Mark was doing in the composition of his gospel, was he was empowering storytellers uh, with an, a, a, an authoritative, more comprehensive collection of the stories of Jesus in a way that made sense. And so this two and a, two, two and a half hour story uh, that was recorded then in the manuscript was a source of empowerment. That's what Mark was doing. That's what we're seeking to do in this, is to continue that tradition of the empowerment of storytelling. So uh, at the source of that is these, uh, the formation of understanding the Bible, and specifically this morning, the story of Jesus' resurrection uh, at the end of Mark, as a story that was told to audiences rather than as a text to be read by readers. And that the purpose of scholarship in this context, this is not the whole context of scholarship, but it is a new context, is the discovery of the quality and character of the sound of the story in its original context, so that then out of a, a depth of knowledge in detail about the stories, we can empower storytellers. Okay, all right. We've been learning the story this morning, and so uh, let me tell it to you uh, for those who are you know, part of the streaming community here. Uh, so this is uh, the end of Mark's Gospel, the climax of the story. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went and bought spices so that they might go and anoint his body. Getting up very early on the first day of the week, they went out to the tomb as the sun was rising. And they were saying to one another, who will go to make a stone for us in the door of the tomb? But looking up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled back. Now, it was a big stone. And going into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right hand, clothed in a white robe. They were terrified. But he said to them, don't be terrified. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. Raised. He isn't here. Look, look at the place where they wait. But you go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. 
There you will see him. Just as he said to you. But going out from the tomb, the women fled. Trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid. This story and this ending has been a source of controversy uh, in the scholarly community. Uh, and in fact, it's been a source of controversy in the entire tradition. Uh, that controversy became early uh, because some scribes saw this ending, which is clearly the ending in the best texts, I could show you the uh, uh, Codex Sinaiticus. In fact, I have it online, in which you can see clearly that 16.8, Epibunta Gar, is the end of the Gospel of Mark in Codex Sinaiticus, which is the earliest uh, text that we have of the Gospel of Mark, uh, discovered in uh, St. Catherine's Monastery uh, at Mount Sinai. Uh, the uh, and it's utterly clear in that manuscript. That's also the ending of the manuscript in Codex Vaticanus, which is, has been the primary uh, text that has been followed more than any other and has been found by textual critics to be the most uh, reliable uh, source of the textual tradition. So the external evidence indicates this was the ending. But from early on, people were dissatisfied with this ending. And so there are, in most Bibles, two additional endings. There's a shorter ending, which was probably later. And there was a longer ending, which was relatively early, probably second century sometime. Uh, the, uh, and that is a conclusion that emerges from the motifs that are present in that longer ending. But many scholars have argued that that was the original ending. And that, uh, in fact, uh, there was a recent book uh, called the, the Mutilation of Mark, mm -hmm. and uh, in which uh, the uh, argument has been uh, that this could not have been the ending. And that uh, what happened was that the original codex of Mark was uh, that the last page and the first page, which contained the birth narrative, were both torn off, that the, that the text was mutilated, uh, and that that's the reason why there is this apparently anomalous ending. Now, the question then that emerges from uh, critical study is would a performance criticism approach to studying and listening to this make any difference in our assessment of the meaning and the probability that this was the original ending? And the answer to that uh, is yes. Uh, it does shed new light. It makes it clear that this is a typical Markan ending that has the characteristics of climactic storytelling that Mark uses throughout the gospel and that is used in storytelling and uh, you know throughout history. So it isn't just that this is an idiosyncratic Markan thing, although it is that, uh, it's characteristic of Mark's storytelling, but it's also that uh, this is uh, 
a frequent uh, strategy for rhetoricians. That is to end with a short, climactic word to demonstrate. <laughs> so, uh, what are the signs of this? And what emerges from a performance criticism study? Okay. Let me briefly describe the character of performance criticism as a what is em it, what is an, an emerging new paradigm for the the exegesis and interpretation of the Bible. <clears throat> And I use paradigm here as a, you know, a word that was popularized by uh, Kuhn in his book, The, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, and it describes then the entire complex, both conceptual and methodological for scientific study, and in this case for the study and uh, development of biblical interpretation. The proposal that emerges from, and that is the source of performance criticism, is that we have operated in biblical scholarship with a massive media anachronism. That is an error. We have operated on the assumption that the Bible was a book of texts read by readers, usually in silence. Uh, and references to the reader and to that construct, either as an individual reader sitting with the manuscript, reading it in silence, or a reader reading to a group, but primarily the image has been a reader with a text. Uh, what has become clear from the study of the communication culture of antiquity is that this assumption about the character of the Bible is wrong, is an error, is a misappropriation uh, that is not supported by the evidence of the character of communication culture. I'll name the primary reasons for that. The first is that it has become clear from the study of uh, the ancient world that most people were illiterate. Uh, current estimates are 85 to 90 percent of persons could not read. Maybe as high as 95 percent in rural areas in the ancient world. It doesn't mean that literate culture was not important and didn't have enormous power, but the majority of people didn't read. The way in which people experienced the compositions of the ancient world was by being performed for audiences. And what becomes clear from the study of Greek rhetoricians and their descriptions of how then ancient compositions were used and from the nature, from the character of ancient education, where the primary task of students in both Jewish and Greco-Roman schools was the memorization of manuscripts so that they could tell them, so they could repeat them. And the extent of a person's education was related to how many speeches, how many stories they knew by heart that they could then perform, they could recite, and use as the basis for compositions that they would make. So Cicero, for example, one of the greatest rhetoricians of Rome, knew hundreds of speeches. And when he composed a new rhetorical address for the Senate in Rome, he based that on things that he knew by heart. And so he was constantly doing them recomposition. It was the same dynamic as happens with jazz musicians now. They know a whole series of memories of melodies, songs, and then they have a repertoire of uh, formats of ways of performing. You know, so I'm, I'm not a jazz pianist, but you know, I know, you know you do a lot of sevenths chords, 
and then you'll do a run up and come back and and you can do that with a lot of different melodies but the the frame for that is the same well that's the way it operated in ancient rhetoric and storytelling was that you knew certain riffs and you could run those riffs on lots of different stories but as long as you knew them intimately then you could improvise on those and recompose well that's the way that it operated uh, with uh, both storytelling and uh, and rhetorical speeches so uh, another uh, line of evidence in relation to this is the, the uh, availability of books. There were books available. There was a book trade. Uh, but relatively speaking, they were expensive. So to make a copy of the Gospel of Mark, which had to be done by hand, would have taken several days. And many of those copies uh, are uh, you know, ancient manuscripts that we have are poorly done. So another dynamic of this is that those texts were just, a, they were just letters. There's no division between words, paragraphs, sentences. So in order to read it, you had to study it and virtually learn it by heart in order to be able to read an ancient manuscript. So what most people did was they'd memorize it. So the role of memory in ancient education and in ancient performance was much greater than we traditionally assume because we've created manuscripts that are easy to read. These were not easy to read. Uh, so if you look at an ancient manuscript, you can see this. Well, what emerges from this is then that the study of the Bible as texts read by readers is what people did in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century after the printing press when everybody could have a copy of Mark, for example. So, and when people normally read in silence. That was not the case in the ancient world. So, the question is then, how do we form a way of studying and interpreting the Bible as performance literature, as materials that were performed for audiences rather than texts read by readers. That's the source of a new paradigm. And what has been become clear from the initial investigations is that it changes everything. It changes your perception, it changes your methodologies, it changes what you see and hear, it changes the perception of the meaning of this. And the ending of Mark is a kind of classic example Now, just to outline very quickly, what are the basic steps of performance criticism? First is to reconstruct the structure of the sound of the story or the speech. A, uh, a way of doing that, a defining uh, method for that, is to develop a sound map. This is a term that uh, uh, Margaret Lee and Brandon Scott have uh, developed, and uh, and they've published a book called Sound Mapping the New Testament. Uh, and a sound map is a score of a story. It's a way of representing in a text the sounds of the story. At the core of a sound map, is the recognition that ancient Greek was composed in breath units. They were called cola and periods. And the breath units then were the way that ancient authors thought. They thought literally in breath units. And the purpose of a sound map is then to represent and to show those cola and periods. Uh, so I, you know, I've got a sound map here of uh, the uh, the resurrection story, and there's some very interesting things that emerge from that 
when you look at a sound map. I don't know. Can they? Can you see this? No. Not very well. Okay. Well, what you can see is that the lines of the story get shorter and shorter as you go through the story, and especially in the end, and with the young man speaking to the women, and then they're fleeing. The periods get shorter and shorter until the last one is only two words in Greek, epabunta gar. Uh, so there is no question when you look at it about the principles of composition in relation to these breath units. Now, what was a breath unit? How did it operate? Well, one of the ways that it operated was if you have a breath unit in which there are, for example, 20 words, you have to move it in order to get those 20 words in one breath. Uh, so uh, it is an indicator. Whereas if the period is three, four words, you can go slow. So I'll give you an example from the uh, from this story. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went and bought spices so that they could go and anoint his body. Well, I can do that in one breath, but I got to move it. So it moves along, and that's the way the first periods are generally in the story. Is they move along and you get a lot of information in a short period of time to provide the setting and the background for the story that's going to follow. At the end of the story, it is, and this is a translation, and going out from the tomb, the women fled for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid. Now in Greek, it's even better in terms of the, the uh, units of the, the breath units. They're shorter. You can't translate it into English uh, in as few words as is in the Greek. So just let me you know, tell you, uh, you know, this ending in Greek, so you can hear at least you know, how short it is. Kai exelthusai epukon apatum ne me. Aiken gar autos. Traumas. Kai ecstasis. Kai udeni uden epan. So what happens then in performance is that the structure of the sound shapes the tempo, the relationships. So after each of these descriptions of the women's response, they went out and fled from the tomb. There's an explanation. Fear and trembling and seized them. They said nothing to anybody. Why? Because they were afraid. Now, another dimension of this sound mapping is that it helps to make clear uh, the patterns of repetition in the story. The most basic technique of composition of ancient writers was repetition. And as you study and listen to the Gospel of Mark, what becomes clear is in a sound map, and one of the things I've done in the sound map is to put in bold every, all the words that are repeated. 
from earlier in the story uh, or uh, in terms of and, and what will follow. What becomes clear is that probably a quarter of the words are repetitions. And it's the most basic technique of composition. Scholarship has been significantly based on the identification of repetitions as the signs of disparate documents that have been merged together. And so the first clue to documentary composition has been what appears to readers to be meaningless repetitions. But repetitions that look like redundancies to a reader are to a storyteller, the links that enable you to remember the story. And for an audience, they are the links that enable them to keep the story in mind and to make the connections between various parts of the story. It's the most basic technique of composition. So another thing that sound mapping does is to change the perception of repetitions from being redundancies to being the basic technique of composition. And this is reflected in also the reconception of the Bible as sound rather than as a text. When you, uh, I'm also a musician, uh, so I play the piano in the organ, I play the piano in the organ all my life. So I know, uh, you know, Rachmaninoff preludes and Mozart sonatas and Beethoven sonatas and Bach partitas and stuff by heart. Uh, the most basic clue for memorizing these long pieces of music is to identify the repetitions. And the most basic technique of compositions of, of composers of music is repetition. So the structure of a sonata is A, then a variation on that theme in a B, and then you come back and you repeat A, that's literally the structure of the composition. It's based on repetition. And variations then on a theme that is developed. And that's the stuff of music. Well, the composition of sound is then based on the creation of these sonic echoes, of these sonic themes that you hear and Hearing the repetition makes it possible to make the connections. So the next time you go to a symphony, you can listen to that and just notice how the repetition of themes and variations on those themes constitutes the way in which a composer literally thinks and composes sound. So this is a fundamental difference then that emerges from the study of biblical text, the sound versus as a text. And one of the major differences then is that you value and recognize the genius of these composers, in this case Mark, versus seeing them as dumb composers who are building in redundancies that we have to somehow figure out how to correct by explaining why did they do such dumb things by, while well, they had multiple documents that they were putting together. So uh, this is one of the bedrock differences that an approach to the study of biblical documents as sound rather than as texts uh, create. So the sound map. Being aware of and paying attention to the sounds of the story is the first step in performance criticism. The second dimension is the audience. Rather than a reader who is getting private communication from an author, in performance criticism, the primary figures are, in the case of Mark, the storyteller, 
and the audience. The primary purpose of the story is to communicate it to the audience. So you're trying to pay attention to what did the audience hear? And what were the associations that were created by these sounds with other things that were already in the mind of the audience? So what is the background of the audience's sound perception? Well, a basic change that happens when it's approached as performance literature is the recognition that Mark was told as a single long story, and that this was typical of storytelling in the ancient world. It takes two to two and a half hours to tell Mark's story. An average evening of entertainment in the ancient world. Uh, Homer's Iliad, which was told whole, took all night. So Mark's story is short by comparison to many of the epics that were told in the ancient world. Uh, and so what that means is that a basic uh, factor in the meaning of the passion narrative, which comes at the end of Mark's gospel, is the echoes of the earlier parts of the story that the audience heard and made connections then between the earlier motifs and what is what comes up at the end. But it's also not just the stories, the earlier parts of the story that night, but it's also all the stories that the storyteller could assume that the audiences knew. So what becomes clear from performance criticism of Mark, my judgment, is that the that Mark assumes that his audiences know the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, by heart. That they would recognize the repetitions of words from Exodus, from Genesis, from the stories of David, and so on. Uh, the story of Samson, uh, as he's uh, standing between the two pillars mm. and, uh, and is being mocked by uh, the uh, Philistines, the three, four thousand who are on the roof. Uh, the same words that are used for the mocking of Samson are used for the mocking of Jesus. Uh, well, uh, what that makes clear is that the listeners would have heard the Jesus story as his being mocked by Gentiles who were making fun of him in the same way that Samson was uh, by the nobles of uh, the and those echoes of earlier stories are present throughout Mark's story, but they are concentrated in the Passion Narrative. The most graphic and explicit is the quotations and allusions to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Jesus quotes it. They are his last words on the cross. But that quotation is the climax of a series of allusions to that psalm that are built into the earlier parts of Jesus, of the story of Jesus' crucifixion. So the soldiers crucified him and divided his garments by throwing dice on them to see what each one of them would get. Quotation from Psalm 22. They divide my garments among them, throwing dice on 
that's a rough quotation of uh, Psalm, of uh, course, in Psalm 22. Uh, another is those who passed by wagged their heads and said, Ah, you would tear down the temple. And in Psalm 22, it is people wag their heads against me. So, what Mark does is to build in quotations, sound connections to Psalm 22, the preeminent psalm of the righteous sufferer in the tradition of Israel, into the story of the crucifixion, in order to connect this story with the traditions of the righteous sufferers of Israel. Now that only become, I mean, we've recognized that, scholars have recognized that for a long time. Uh, but when you hear it, it makes much more impact than when you simply look at it in the text. So these sonic echoes, these allusions to and quotations of other stories, and it's not only that Mark quotes things, which clearly he knew by heart, and simply wove into his story, but it's also allusions to storytelling traditions. So both in terms of things that are the same and things that are different. So one of the major structural elements of the Gospel of Mark is a series of allusions to the messianic traditions of Israel in which Jesus is a nonviolent Messiah in contrast to Saul, David, and the kings of Israel, all of whom were military leaders who formed an army and carried out battles against the enemies of Israel. That is, the Messiahs of Israel, the primary tradition of the Messiah, was warriors. The major contrast between the gospel and the traditions of the Messiah is that Jesus doesn't kill anybody. And he recruits a band of disciples, not as warriors, but as ones who he teaches to heal, to anoint those who are sick to proclaim the kingdom of God in a way that is wholly nonviolent and to be prepared to take the consequences of that namely that they might get killed which according to the traditions all of them were with the possible exception of John so the difference between the messianic traditions which are quoted and alluded to in a whole series of ways through Mark's story is also to make the contrast between Jesus as a Messiah and the Messiahs of Israel earlier so he is the fulfillment of prophecies about the Messiah but it's also a major reversal of expectations uh, for the audiences so Noticing then and paying attention to the background that the audience brings to the illusions and the things that the storyteller is alluding to that he knows are in the minds of the audience is a fundamental structure of composition. Other elements. Uh, the identification of the dynamics of relationship between the storyteller and the audience. Uh, this is called audience address. Uh, I'm not going to take time right now to describe that in detail, but basically it is that in storytelling, a storyteller becomes a series of characters. And in the Gospel of Mark, and in all the Gospels, the primary character who the storyteller presents, other than himself, is Jesus. And Jesus is told in the story addressing a whole group of various groups of people, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, uh, crowd, the twelve, his disciples. 
And what happens is that just as the storyteller becomes, represents, presents different characters, more than Jesus, Pilate, Peter, uh, the chief priests, the high priest, and so on. What happens is that the audience also is addressed as different characters in the story. The disciples, Jesus' various dialogue partners. So the audience experiences themselves as being addressed as different characters. They also change in their character identification just as the storyteller does. It's one of the dynamics of storytelling. That's different than drama. It's different than, uh, it's distinctive to storytelling as an art form. So dimensions of that are uh, asides that the storyteller tells the audience. So a frequent pattern in storytelling that is recognized by performance is that Mark will say something that is initially puzzling. And then in the next sentence, we'll explain it. What this does is to create a dynamic of intimacy between the storyteller and the audience. There is a greater concentration of these audience asides in the story of the resurrection than any place else. So in the ending, uh, it is literally structured as audience asides. Going out from the tomb, the women fled. Why? Why would they flee? Why would they do what the disciples did? Uh, running away at the arrest. Why would they flee? Let me tell you. Trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. This is the greatest, most humorous thing in the whole of the tradition of the story. Over and over again during the story, Jesus has told people, the disciples, others, to be quiet and not say anything to anybody about what's happened, about what he's done. So now, finally, the lid is off. It's now free and open season. Go tell. And what do they do? They're like kids. Now, ah, they do exactly the opposite of what they're commanded to do. So they say nothing to anyone. So it's funny on the one hand. On the other hand, it is a primary reversal of expectations. Why would they do that? Why would they not say anything? Because they've got the greatest news in history to tell. Why would they do it? Well, let me tell you. The reason was they were afraid. And the listeners. In the aftermath of the Judean Roman War, could immediately understand that fear. Because people, Judeans, all over the Greco Roman world were being killed, or being publicly associated with and advocating reconciliation with Gentiles. The ending of war, the advocacy in Roman context. Peacemaking was the way by which God will establish peace rather than Augustus' way, which is kill everybody and dominate everybody, and then you'll have peace. So uh, this was both an ancient issue, it's also a modern issue. So these audience asides and explanations then, you know, you can observe as a performance critic, huh? uh, what's going on between the storyteller and the audience in, this, in these ancient stories. And then those are also clues about what you do if you want to tell the story now. Pay attention to those things. Well, those are things that have a very different perception when they're seen in, uh, in uh, the frame of performance. Another one of another thing to pay attention to in, in uh, performance criticism is the dynamics of distance and characterization. So uh, the what becomes clear 
uh, as you listen to the stories, is that a primary factor in the meaning of the story is the dynamics of distance between the audience and the various characters. And this has become a major source of misunderstanding of what the gospel originally meant. Because the gospel has been perceived as creating a polemic of condemnation and alienation from Jews and specifically in the story of the pilot trial from the crowd. And that the purpose of Mark's, the structure of Mark's story is to create alienation and condemnation of the character of the crowd as the one that is responsible for Jesus' death. It is this reading of the structure of the characterization that is the source of Christian anti-Semitism and of the perception that Mark's purpose in the formation of his gospel and in the telling of the story was anti-Jewish polemic, which has become virtually a an accepted conclusion about Mark in the scholarly community. And not just Mark, also Matthew, Luke, and John. What emerges from a performance criticism study is that this is a misperception of the dynamics of distance in the characterization of the crowd and of the Jews. It is something that emerges from textual study from a psychologically detached position of examining documents rather than from a position of engagement in the telling and hearing of the story, which changes the dynamics of distance and characterization. So a part of the Messiah of Peace and what we have been doing in this seminar is yesterday, uh, Laura and Norman told the story of the man and the woman in the garden and of Moses uh, in at Sinai uh, with the story of the golden calf. And what we experienced in hearing that was then the dynamics of the rhetoric, the difference between the rhetoric of condemnation, which is also present in the traditions of Israel and in Mark, the chief priests are characterized as bad guys who just get worse and worse. Uh, Judas is a bad guy who gets worse and worse as uh, which reaches its climax when uh, he came up, went right up to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. That's the climax of the characterization of Judas. Well, the climax of the characterization of the chief priests is those who were passing by mocked him, saying, hey, you who would tear down the temple and build it in three days, come on down from the cross. And the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, ah, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the Messiah of Israel, come down from the cross now that we might see and <laughs> believe. That's the climax of the characterization of the chief priest. Now, it is a characterization of condemnation but not the characterization of the crowd. It is what I'm calling the rhetoric of involvement and implication, in which a character with whom the audience is invited to identify deeply, sympathetically, like the man and the woman in the garden, like the people of Israel at Sinai, like David in the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, this intimate, 
aesthetic distance relationship to a character in which there's a high degree of sympathetic identity. These are really very attractive characters with whom you're invited to identify at a very deep level as a listener to the story. Then do something that is clearly, unambiguously wrong. The man and the woman eat the fruit of the tree. The people of Israel make a golden calf and worship other gods. David commits adultery with Bathsheba and then has her husband, Uriah, killed. Now, these stories are have the same structure as the story of the pilot tribe, in which we are invited to identify with the crowd as the most sympathetic character throughout the whole gospel. They're always chasing Jesus around the sea. Everything that he does, the crowd loves. They're like little kids. Uh, they follow him around. Uh, and he gives them primary teaching. There's a close relationship between Jesus and the crowd that is established throughout the whole story. And when he gets to Jerusalem, the chief priests want to arrest him. But they can't. They don't because of the crowd. Because the crowd love it. They love everything that Jesus says. So, uh, so the crowd is then the most unambiguously sympathetic character in the whole of the Gospel of Mark. So when then in the Pilate trial, he says, and coming up, the crowd began to demand that he observe the custom of course, what the listeners think is, they'll ask for Jesus. He'll get released. He won't have to be crucified. But the crowd changes its mind and asks for Barabbas instead. He was a representative of the war and of the policy of making war against the enemy. So what happens then in the pilot trial is not condemnation of the crowd. It is rather engagement with the crowd in relation to this then primary puzzle. Why would we choose the way of the war, which in the recent experience of Mark's listeners, is the greatest tragedy in the entire history of Israel. The temple was destroyed somewhere between a million three hundred to five hundred thousand Jews were either killed or taken as slaves. Why would we do this? That's the puzzle. That's also the puzzle now. Why does the human race continue to choose the myth of redemptive violence as this primary locus of worship and belief in relation to what actions we take rather than following the ways of peace that Jesus both advocated and modeled? In a way, the uh, Jewish war it's for us like 9 11. We read lots of things in the light of that. It was so terrible, we've got to do terrible things to compensate for it or avenge it. Or but why do we elect a black president who says no more war? Why does the majority get behind that? And then we keep war. <laughs> what happens to the leader, even when called to peace, who ends up yes. war? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's the question raised by the story and the well, the experience very of very afraid. Yeah. very afraid. Yep. Well, so what emerges from a performance criticism study of Mark's passion narrative is then a, a very different perception of what it meant. That in turn opens up 
a series of possibilities in relation to strategies for peacemaking. That the power of the telling of the stories is made clear by a performance criticism study and opens the possibility of thinking about, well, what if the people of the Christian community around the world were to learn these stories of peace and learn the gospel and then take it as a model for what we would do because the most striking thing about Jesus story is that he does good for his enemies indeed that is in the story a underlying explanation of the reason why he got killed was that he had he both did it and advocated that climactically in the temple when he said uh, made this demonstration overturned the tables of the money changers because the court of the gentiles had been turned into a place of service for the sacrificial cult in which there was no quiet place to pray to Gentiles at all. It had been turned into a marketplace for the sacrificial cult inside in the temple. Jesus then said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer among all the nations? But you have made it into a den of, and the word that Mark uses is lace taste, which doesn't mean bandits or robbers. It means, in the context of Mark's community and those to whom he is telling the story, it means those who were the advocates of the war. It means the insurrectionists. And that is exactly what happened at the end of the war was that the temple became the last battle, it was the, the scene of the final siege and of then the terror of the Romans breaking through the walls, killing all the people who were there in the temple, of whom there were thousands, and destroying the temple. So Mark's description then of Jesus' protest in the temple resonates with the experience of Mark's listeners and is an allusion to what has just happened in Jerusalem. So is this another variation of when you're under Caesar, what is Caesar's? She's saying don't go to war with Rome is what you're saying? The insurrection, the fighting of the empire is not what we need to be. Yes. I hadn't thought of it in relation to that saying which in its context is one of the classic instances of Jesus throwing it back to his listeners. And so it's, a, it's an answer that is not an answer. Uh, well, that's why the coin. Uh, well, uh, is this coin what belongs to Caesar? Or as the major faction in Israel said, everything belongs to God. Which is also why this is, in a sense, the, uh, in our present context, the rewriting or the, restart of the creation story. Because the creation story rewritten then uh, suggests a different response than we see in the marketplace, which is the uh, powers that be breaking the earth, rocking them. Yeah. 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 And we're not going to win our fight against them necessarily by overthrowing the system, but by rewriting the story or the rules. Mm -hmm. Interesting thought. Mm -hmm. That won't make us popular. No, you better go again. <laughs> <laughs> So where your where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yeah, treasure is in the Pentagon. 
Yeah. I mean, you think they don't even have enough treasure? You know, <laughs> they always want more. Of them the more treasure than they want. Right. Yep. 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 I have a question. So, we were, for me, I've arrived at a point where I understand the need to be peaceful or to make a choice that's peaceful to end a cycle. But what I've learned more about is the nature of the oppression. So you just described a force that annihilates the temple and all the people therein, wiping a nation of peoples off the earth. So I don't really feel, I feel like there's a peace missing. How can there be peace when to do nothing is death, to do something is death, it all comes down to death. So. So when you're dealing with roaming, so in, in the context of the story of Mark, and even in today, when, when from where I live, we hear about the Republicans who oppose, how do you get the oppressors, the opposition, the ruling powers that be to play ball? When, if they don't like you, they'll just swat you or use you for entertainment. So I've arrived now listening to a conundrum. Speaking historically, uh, what happened with the development of uh, the extension of the Jesus story in the Greco-Roman world was uh, absolutely remarkable. New communities were formed of uh, Jews and Gentiles who became advocates of uh, doing good for the Romans. They established charity networks in which they provided food and help for slaves all over the Roman world for people who were oppressed and for uh, and reached out to the nobility of Rome. And over the course of the next centuries, there was a gradual transformation of Roman society by the increased belief in Jesus as the Messiah. And eventually, you know, now, an absolutely remarkable thing from the perspective of 72 at the time of Mark's story being composed. Rome is now the center of and is identified with not primarily the Roman Empire, but with the Christian Church. It is the center of the Roman Catholic Church, the largest religion in the world. And there is now a leader there who's advocating for preservation of this one planet we've been given and, um, and for caring poor. for the poor um, I mean, it hasn't always been leadership like that but there is now pretty remarkable well and that has been a line of continuity right. yeah. the various monastic communities the communities of the church have been primary advocates and in western the history of western civilization the source of hospitals schools the whole uh, networks of education and health care well were established and developed slavery. by the church. Yeah. So, so it's not an unambiguous history, but the primary stream that becomes clear is that it is transformative. And the telling of the story has been, over the course of history, transformative in positive ways in society. And doing good for the enemy has been a way of a strategy, a policy, at times, by no means unambiguously. Uh, you know, the history of Western civilization and of Christianity is a, is a history of warfare. Uh, on the one hand, but it has also been a history of peacemaking and of doing good for the poor for those who are oppressed. It has been a primary source of transformation in the history of, uh, of Western civilization and in the history of the world. Thank you, that helps. 
So, and, and as you're speaking, I hear in my mind, um, do unto others as you would have done unto you. So not to see them as the enemy, or I'm not going to do something good for you because you're a fill in the blank. Um, and uh, go out and serve for the least of these when you have helped. The least of these you have helped me. Right. Is what's being out of it. Right. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Um, I have a question too. Um, so would you then see as the real reason of making um, Constantine making the like co-opting the Christians' religion and by making it a state religion and able to try and circumvent some of this transformation? Or well it's one of the it's one of the Yeah. It's like they they prefer Barabbas, they prefer Constantine. Yeah. The uh that has to be set in historical context. Mm -hmm. The emperor prior to Constantine was Diocletian. Who, when he became emperor, said, we have to end this. We are going to eliminate the Christian church. And so his first major decree was the decree against Christian books. It was forbidden that anyone would have a copy of the Christian book. They were all to be burned. And anybody who was caught with Christian books, preserving them, Hiding them was executed. The greatest period of persecution was under Diocletian. Thousands were killed. Constantly Bishops were killed. Him. Yes. Uh, and so uh, the uh, this had been a periodic effort on the part of the Roman government and various emperors over the period from the time of Mark until the time of Constantine uh, carry out persecutions against the church. People were martyred, they were beheaded, they were uh, required to fight animals in uh, wild animals in the Colosseum. Uh, the, uh, uh, that happened at the end of the first century. The story of Polycarp is a kind of classic instance a bishop who was condemned, and then he wrote a series of documents on his way to Rome, uh, letters that were preserved, and he then was uh, he was killed by lions, and tigers in the Colosseum. Uh, that was indicative of a policy that was followed because. Christians would not worship the emperor, uh, which was required. Uh, so that decision was a, a, a primary decision. And what happened at the time of Diocletian was that hundreds of leaders of the church did burn incense and survive. And that became the source of the Donatus controversy. Yes. Uh, that was a primary conflict because people in the church said, we're not going to follow these leaders. They burned incense to Caesar. They have no no credibility as leaders. But what was the connection with Constantine? Well, Constantine then recognized that this policy, essentially what happened was Diocletian gave up. He retired. He just took off. He said, I've had it. And he retired to an estate outside Rome and, and gave up on this policy of trying to eliminate the church. Constantine, then, when he came to power, uh, my cynical version of the story is that the night before his, his great battle at the Battle of Mulian Bridge, he had a conversion experience in which he saw Jesus uh, saying, by this sign, the cross, you will triumph. And the next morning, he went to his troops and said, under the banner of Christ, we will fight. Well, a significant part of his enemy, uh, of his army, were Christians. Uh, and so uh, he changed the policy in order to get his army to fight. 
he won, and after then the victory, he abolished all efforts to abolish and destroy the Christian church. What policy, he stopped. What policy did he change? Diocletian's policy. Oh. Diocletian. I thought the Christians weren't going to fight. No, that's the one. Christians he tolerated fight. Christians. He himself, I don't think, abolished all of the religions. I think he oh. tolerated, and then the next move. But he, but he ended the Diocletian policy yes. of Correct. trying to eliminate the church and mass martyrdom for anybody who would have Christian books. One of his first things that he did was to sponsor, at enormous cost, Codex Vaticanus. So he got the best scribes in the world and the best materials to create the best manuscript of the Bible that was possible. An exact reversal of the policy of Diocletian, which was to burn all the Christian books. So there was under Constantine a transformation of policy by the government in relation to the church. And what we now characterize as Constantine Christianity is a result of a lot of other things. Yes. That no. of that time. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it is a very mixed picture. I'm not saying this is, uh, but you can see why it was a big deal. The new deal was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, the big deal was that the government wasn't trying to kill everybody who wouldn't worship the emperor and who worshiped Christ. Well, it may have preserved the traditions and the stories around Jesus as a Messiah of peace, which might have been lost. That's right. And the state had I mean, uh, you know the, the you know a bottom line is Codex Vaticanus is our best best text. Yeah. So what textual critics more often than not choose as the best text is Codex Vaticanus, which could be called Codex Constantinus. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Constantine who was responsible for that text. Mm -hmm. So you know, so there are you know these very graphic. Uh, you know, historical remnants of that period, of which the Gospel of Mark is is one. So he was like good news and bad news. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah. good news that he saved the writings for us. He was bad news that he had God championing war. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But considering yeah. that he was a product of his era, that's not hard to understand. So if you see him as a transitional figure, he's 50-50. And mm -hmm. um, further, we were talking about the tomb during the last lesson, and I just recently learned this year that his mother was sent out on a mission to preserve physical spots of Christianity, and the birthplace of Jesus That's was right. made The Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem was built by Constantine's mother. mother. Mm -hmm. so she, so the the Church of the Holy Sepulchre right. as the place where... Jesus' resurrection is revered, was built by Constantine. And now preserved, sort of, thanks to that association. So it's sort still of there. interesting. We started all this, you know, this is about performance criticism. We were talking about um, the importance of the oral tradition and how, at some level, now we need to study and reconnect with that oral tradition. But we're also kind of winding up here showing how important the written tradition is as yeah. well. <laughs> well, it was. It was the, the written tradition preserves the, oral the performance. Story, right, right. But we just have to remember that, that, that that's what's happening. Yes. That the written tradition is preserving for us an oral tradition. So right. not to lose sight of that. Right. Right. And we don't, you know, we haven't talked much about politics, but precisely, I think, because we don't have a socialist movement in this country anymore, the stories of the social movement haven't been preserved. Right. Right. Yeah. I think Joe Hill who said as he was hung, as he was hanged for something he didn't do, he said, don't mourn me, organize. That's kind of what Jesus said. <laughs> that's, true. That's, true. that's true, that's true. That's right, go and tell. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. But you know, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about your notion that which you attribute to Jesus, and I think with good reason, of doing good to, right. the, to the opponent. Uh, and I've been trying to ask myself, what would that mean for me? And one thing that's come up that 
is involved in our discussion about the way we were received by our fellow scholars. Uh, I think when I was much younger and just publishing stuff, I, I had a very thin skin and was bothered by criticism. And and, and had hostile thoughts for some of these guys. Yep. Yep. And uh, I sort of, because I didn't attack them back, I said, well, I'm just uh, a kind of a sweet natured guy. It's my yeah. nature not to. Right. But actually, I didn't. <laughs> I felt like when Yadin said he's been very rude to you, you can say anything you want. Right. But now I think one of the ways I can do good is is not to attack these people in response, uh, not to dismiss what they have to say, even, right? You know, to listen to their right. criticism, and that if I'm going to win any way with some of them, it, it's going to have to be in that manner. Yep. And I wonder, part of that is why these couple of major New Testament scholars. The last needle like the introduction for a huh. series of essays. And I said, I'm not I'm not an assessment scholar, but yeah. They said, Well, we can't think of one who would do this. Who would do it better? I yep. could have said Tom Boomshine. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but I don't know if Tumblr is, is that you with it. <laughs> so well, but that there's there's no way there's no way that I could do what you can do. Yeah. Uh, because of what you've done. Yeah. But what you're identifying was a major thing that I had to work through in order to write this book. Yeah. Because the degree of disagreement <laughs> that is present in this book from major traditions <laughs> of biblical study, not just methodologic, but this whole conclusion that Mark is anti Jewish. This is going to be highly controversial. And there are people who are going to be very angry about this and will reject it. So I fully expect that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so that is something that I know is ahead. Yeah. Uh, the, and part of what has been difficult for me has been to deal with that in a way that both honors and presents clearly the data as to why the gospel does not support that conclusion about uh, about the meaning of Mark and its context. Well, there's the other threat here. I mean, what has followed from that is who needs to hear these stories? Who needed to hear those stories then? And what was the consequence of hearing them? And who needs to hear them now right. in the context of that history? And what is the threat? Of them hearing. So, one of the ways we gave up our anti Semitism was to promise to stop proselytizing Jews to become Christians. And yet, who are we telling these stories to then? And why? If it isn't to the pagans, the unchurched, the wrongly church, etc. To state uh, and, and a, a, very, a politically impossible thing now given the pivotal character of the government of Israel and its policies in relation to the Palestinians that is one of the major sources of the Islamic Revolution and of the United States identification with this is the telling of these stories to Americans and to Jews in relation to this policy of wiping them out, marginalize, establish more and more settlements, take over the land. So there is a sense in which I think that the gospel does need to be announced and told to the representatives of the Jewish government in Israel now because of this policy and that this policy is in the long term going to be a disaster. Well, the Jews would agree with that too. That's right. Why, why can I 
That's a great question. It makes me think of the original context again. So these stories were, seems to me, a lot of them were told to people who were oppressed, who were slaves, who felt hopeless. And that was true of the Hebrew scriptures as well at times. So I think that's part of what motivates me to tell them and teach them in prisons and jails because a lot of those folks are pretty, feel pretty hopeless. Well, I mean, I've heard that from them. And so, so these stories, I think, are a way of giving hope to people. And hopelessness is often at the core of violence as well. And people you know, have nothing, no hope, and they have nothing to lose. So I think that that's another reason. Right, and, and that and so that the so another thing that emerges from this is these stories need to be told to people who are in prison and who are imprisoned by poverty. Uh, so yeah. it's both political, yeah. but it's also but that is intensely political. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other part of the history is that the Declaration of Human Rights was a finally endorsed and adopted with the support of Christians and Muslims who each understood that to preserve the other's right to proselytize, that to preserve their own right to proselytize, the others had to be recognized and respected as well. So in that sense, one could argue that these stories also need to be told to the Muslim world to understand that it's not Christianity that they're experiencing yeah. as a conflict yes. power right. is not the theological or the practical the grounding of, of the story. Right. I want to say what you okay. do. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, I've tried three times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I see our government is is increasingly uh, seeing the people of the United States as the enemy mm -hmm. and treating them as such. And I think the growing hopelessness in you know not feeling like I don't vote, all of that is because they are feeling um, and rightly so. Um, so I'm wondering. This seems to me like the population should be right for these stories. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's just how do we, how do we get to it? Right. right. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to add about your situation and my situation. Uh, my book came out in 1979, early 80s, 1980s, and it was uh, I would say 10, 12 years before <clears throat> I was honored to be the president of the Society of Illustrators. So what happened? <clears throat> My book made a dent, maybe not much more, but a serious dent on customary ways of thinking about the Bible and going in texts without any social <clears throat> awareness. So I think what happened was more and more people began to say, you've got to ask those social questions. Now, that was in a certain thing, and I agree or don't agree, or, you know, but what he tried to do, we need to do. Yeah. And even to this day, I will be scorned by people yeah. for that, and also railed against for my conclusion that Joshua is not talking about the actual historical annihilation right. of the Canaanites. Right. But anyway, so you might prevail with the method that you're provoke, provoking and still not be happily received about your particular thesis. And that's a victory. Yep. <laughs> well, in a way, that's what's happened. Uh, the, uh, the Bible and Ancient Modern Media group that I started in 1983, approximately the same period as when. Uh, like the hour was published. Uh, that was uh, rejected for two years uh, by the program committee. Uh, but uh, it has had a major transformative effect. And so 
the establishment of performance criticism is not just a boomer shine idea. There's a whole group of people now who are pursuing performance criticism and this reconception of the Bible as performance literature rather than as text read by readers. And so there is a way in which the methodology, and that's true also of narrative criticism, a lot of people are doing that. And it's been yeah. so the conclusions that follow from that are not necessarily accepted. And that would be the case. The majority of even mm -hmm. the advocates of performance criticism would not agree with my conclusions about Mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, but and, but there there yeah. has been that. So in relation to the issues of peacemaking. No, my conviction, my hope, that's what it is, the hope of this weekend, which this is the first time that this exploration in relation to peacemaking has been done. My hope is that the overall approach will gain credibility and be extended more widely. And that the conclusions of this book may be provocative in relation to rethinking this. I don't expect that everybody's going to agree, but I hope that it will lead to a reassessment uh, and a reexamination of basic conclusions, the most important of which is that the gospel, well, they're right. The most important of which is the advocacy of the Messiah of peace, and that that was central to the meaning and impact of Mark and its original context. I think, you know, Tom, one reason why I, within a, de within a decade, recognized was that I was dealing with established source criticism, yeah. criticism and saying, okay, let's take this a little bit. Whereas I think there's a special onus in this area of the oral traditions. Uh, so I think you may have a steeper oh, yeah. hill to climb that I had. Yes. It might take you 15 years. Uh, but I, I was partly uh, backed by the third world reading yes. mm -hmm. of tribes. It, it just amazed me. I never, I mean, even thinking about them specifically as an yeah. audience, I was trying to crack that as a scholar. Yeah. Uh, and how widely it was read. Yeah. I, I just had a, a thought with the, the Messiah of Peace and understanding Jesus as a Messiah of Peace and the re, the re interpretation of understanding of the gospel. It's like is is a concept is an understanding as time has come because you know we now have a capability of destroying the world really easily. Um, and whether through what we're doing with the, the climate change or um, nuclear weapons. Is that kind of led me think of the Jesus talking about a second coming. So maybe a second coming is, is is understanding what he was about and getting that out, um, as opposed to you know. right. yeah. this, this, is, this makes me this makes me uh, think of what we had planned to do as the end of our time together. This may be a good point to yeah. segue offline and continue the conversation in terms of larger logistics and so on. I think we have. Uh, captured over the series of uh, live stream tapes, the core content, and now let's, let's yeah. us go into that conversation. Is there anything you want to say as we close the yes. live stream up? What we're going to do, and I would suggest that everybody in uh, who has been part of this uh, through the internet, uh, that you would do this exercise yourself, and that would be First, to identify what have been your experiences of doing good for your enemies. That might be your spouse, might be your children, might be people in your family, it might be people on the other side of racial boundaries, of class boundaries, of religion boundaries. One of the things that I've noticed is that Protestants and Catholics in the United States basically don't go to each other's spaces. Uh, so, you know, so individually, when have you had the experience of doing good for your enemy? And when have you experienced someone on the other side of these boundaries doing good for you?
to remember those, to identify what those stories, those experiences have been. The second one is, what are the stories of doing good for your enemies as a part of a corporate entity? So I think of the Marshall Plan as the United States response to the end of the Second World War and to uh, the German and the Japanese nations as enemies. Uh, so what have been the stories of doing good for the enemy that have happened in relation to the corporate communal conflicts and institutions of which we are all a part? The third would be, as an individual, to name a current conflict or enemy and propose a plan for doing good for them. To start thinking about that. What could we as, in, as individuals do in relation to our individual enemies? And fourth, to name a current conflict or enemy and propose a plan for doing good for them in the corporate relationships that we have as part of the corporate entities of which we are members. What could we do that would be good for our enemies? And to start thinking about that, identifying specific, they might be very small, but those small symbolic actions clearly have enormous impact. So both individually and corporately to identify what we've experienced before and what we could identify to do in the future and then the invitation is to start doing gar gar <laughs> 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 <laughs>